we are going to be talking to you about bylaws, scholarships, and finance. Now, I'm, I know this is not the most sexiest of topics for an afternoon session, but bylaws are very important for your group and chapter, and scholarships are ex something that we want all of our groups to strive for. We are very proud of the number of scholarships that we hand out, as they talked earlier this morning. And then the finance portion of having a group or a chapter with the Alumni Association, there's a variety of different things that are different from other institutions that we just want to cover those with you. So first, we're going to talk about bylaws for a constituent group, the next one. And the purpose of bylaws. This is important for you to just structure how your group is supposed to run. It can outline a variety of different things, uh, such as the size and function of your group, um, how you elect individuals to serve on your board, um, rules for voting, and just kind of like the overall governing function. So before I move on, I want to be able to like kind of relate this, these topics to you. So let's kind of go through the room and just quickly tell me what group you're with or what you associate with as an alumni. What's your? I'm um, uh, just a member of the alumni association. Just perfect. Five mm -hmm. members. Okay. And your university college. Awesome. Just Frank Blue alumni. Okay. Liam Bed. Health Studies. Law. National Board. New York City. New York City. Alone. Fabulous. So we have a variety of people here who actually have st structured bylaws for different groups, and then we have a variety of you that are for uh, those out-of-town groups. So bylaws are technically for our groups that are have that more formalized group. They're having those meetings every month or uh, every quarter. They're having those monthly events or quarterly events as well. So for those who are out-of-town representatives, this isn't something that would truly apply to you. You wouldn't necessarily have to have a governing set of bylaws, but for our other groups, that's what these are for. So we're going to go through kind of just the main outline of what your bylaws would look like. And this is, again, we're not going to have to go deep into this, but if you are creating a bylaw for your group, it would obviously first start with your name, your chapter, and where you're located. And then the fiscal year of the university and of the alumni association, which is June, or excuse me, July 1st through June 30th. Then the next section is to outline your Board of Directors. These are anyone that is associated with this group. It can be anyone who graduated from University College, anyone who graduated from Lambeth, um, or just anyone who's in the city of Minnesota um, that associates with um, the organization. Uh, one thing that when you are structuring your bylaws, the qualifications to be part of the board is really important. In that, you will want to make sure that you specifically state that anyone who does serve on your board is a paid member of the Alumni Association. That is very crucial, as you know, for the association as a whole to grow our membership so all of our board members are to be members of the association. Um, other things that are on here, such as quorum, when you're voting on large pieces of business, you want to know how many, pieces, I mean, how many people need to be present for your board meeting to conduct such business. And removal. And uh, resignation, I know that kind of sounds a little harsh, but something why this is important is if you have a group of people that are saying that they're serving on your board, but they're not attending your meetings and they're not showing up and they're not participating or paying their dues, this allows you as a board to actually conduct business on maybe possibly removing those board members and make room for members who are actually wanting to participate and engage. And that's why those kind of pieces are very relevant and important for your bylaws. The next section of a bylaw outlines your officers. These are the people that are your president, vice president, or president-elect, secretary, treasurer, or past president. Some groups actually do make it important that the past president has an active role as an officer. Some groups don't, so that's kind of a personal choice for the organization that you are constructing these bylaws for. Um, secretary, treasurer can either be a combined position or you can either separate them into two. Again, that's a preference. Uh, later on in the, this presentation about finances, you'll learn your alumni coordinator basically takes care of all of your finances through the Alumni Association, so that's why it's always um, an idea to combine them. In this section, when you're outlining your officers, this is also where you want to outline the qualifications for who can be an officer, their removal, and any vacancies. 
Um, the next section are committees, and this is just an idea of type of committees that you guys can include in your bylaws, and this is just an option. You, don't, you can expand on these as you'd like. So the first one would be your executive committee. This includes all of those officers, that president, uh, vice president, treasury secretary, and past president, along with all the chairs of the committees that you have within your group. Those executive directors typically would meet before and have a more um, intimate meeting about type of business that they would bring to the entire board meeting of other members um, at large. Another committee is called a nomination committee. This is where you would get a group of people to bring nominations of other board members to serve on, on your board um, with your group and then bring that to a committee at, as a whole, as your board as a whole. Next. Um, scholarship and awards committee. Again, we want to make sure that all of our groups have a scholarship that they are working towards to award and this would be someone and a group of people that would look at those recipients to apply for your scholarship or come up with ways to have fundraising events to raise more money for those scholarships, which leads into the Alumni Relations Committee. This is a broad committee and this is the group that I um, suggest to new groups that are kind of starting out. Your Alumni Relations Committee are your events, your reunions, your um, award ceremonies. All of those can fall under alumni relations versus trying to have a reunion committee, a awards committee, a um, homecoming committee. They all fall under alumni relations. So if you're a new group starting out, I always say start with alumni relations. Something I do want to point out, again, this may be relevant to m some of you. If your organization, your alumni chapter, does have a formal awards ceremony. You have a scholarship that you are having a formal award event. I'll, I'll use um, the law chapter. They have their annual Pillars of Excellence event where it's a formalized dinner where they honor different individuals from the legal community. In their set bylaws actually has all the criteria for how that recipient is selected. The process for when the meetings take place, the actual criteria that the recipient has to meet. Um, I always think it's very important to include those uh, criteria into your bylaws because if you have it as a separate document, it's not something that your entire group can go back to in one place. So I find it, I suggest that you always want to include all of your award criteria in your bylaws. And then the next one is amendments. Um, times are always changing. Things are always fluid. You don't want to um, construct yourself to one um, way of doing things. So the amendment section allows you to make changes to your bylaws. Any questions about bylaws? I know, it's not, it's not a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, but they're very important. So if you have any questions about bylaws, always ask your alumni coordinator. You probably already have bylaws set in place and your alumni coordinator can give them to you and make suggestions on how to update them. Scholarships, this is a little bit more fun. So there are three types of scholarships that um, we're we'll, we gonna talk about. Um, the first two are through the foundation. Does everyone know what the foundation is? Who does not know what the foundation is? Okay, the foundation is a separate entity, a separate 501c3 uh, entity where the Alumni Association and the university house is a majority of their financial funds. So these scholarships go through that and it's separate from the university. Did I answer that well? So there's two uh, scholarships through the foundation. One is called non-endowment scholarships. Second is endowment scholarships and university scholarships. So I'm gonna talk to you about all three of those. The first one is the non-endowment scholarships. These are also known as current expendable funds. These are funds that you can use whenever you like and you can actually award the scholarship up to the, z like you can award the entire amount of the scholarship. So if you have $5,000 in this account, you can award $5,000. It can go to a zero balance. It doesn't get budgeted every year um, and the scholarship amount will be based on the fund agreement that you have or gift agreement and I'll talk about that next. But that's what the difference is, is you can put as much money in and you can take as much money out as you would like. So that's the, that one. Endowment scholarships, these are different. To have an endowed scholarship, it has to have a balance of $30,000. Now you can actually have a current expendable and non-endowed scholarship where you're currently raising money and once you reach that 30,000 threshold, you can take that $30,000 and turn it into an endowed scholarship. 
The difference for an endowed scholarship is those funds are meant to be invested, and they are. The foundation invests those monies to make more money. And based on what that account earns, they have come up with a number, which is 4%, and what that 4% is of your earnings of that $30,000 is what is budgeted for you to be awarded. So let's say you had a scholarship that had $100,000 in it. Then 4% of the earnings would be $4,000, $4, and you would have the option to give $4,000 in a scholarship. Now, it gets kind of confusing on who budgets the money, how much is invested, where is that money coming from, and to be honest, I couldn't tell you exactly all of that, but I do know that the foundation, who's also housed in the Alumni Center building, works very diligently to invest the funds accurately to make the most money so that there's enough scholarship uh, money to be awarded. <coughs> the university scholarships, these are funds that are actually housed on the university side, not through the foundation. Basically, this is where students, the grant accounting and uh, scholarship office, then once we say this student receives $2,000 in scholarships, they build a foundation and the foundation sends them the $2,000 that gets, gets deposited into the student's account. So we don't technically work a lot with them, but they're the ones that take the money from the foundation and award it to the students through that scholarship. Any questions so far? Okay. The scholarship fund agreement. So if you are with a group and you're like, we want to start a scholarship, where do we start? You would work with your alumni coordinator and first you would find out if you had the funds to start a scholarship. Typically for a current expendable, they like you to have $2,000 minimum to establish the account, but those things can be waived depending on the, cer the current situation. But you would work with your alumni coordinator and you would create this fund that is an agreement between the group as the donor, you guys are donating the money from events that you've raised money for, the university and the U of M Foundation. This fund agreement outlines all the criteria that you want the scholarship recipient to match to receive this award. So it could be a GPA, they could be a major in accounting or in university college, um, a student at the Lambeth campus, things like that. This is where you would actually outline what the scholarship is about and how it's going to be awarded. The total amount and if it's going to be only fall semester, fall and spring, or it's just a spring semester, that's what this agreement's about and identifies, you know, the approval for awarding. The cool thing that has changed is that there is a system called Tiger Scholarship Manager and it is an online scholarship system. So after you work with your alumni coordinator to create the scholarship, then we work with the scholarship office to establish the scholarship inside Tiger Scholarship Manager. So when a student is looking to be a, like looking for scholarships, they log in and this is every scholarship available across the campus. And the cool thing about it is once the student logs in and they fill out their general application, based on different criteria of scholarships, they will say, hey, you are matched with all these scholarships. So that's how if you have very specific criteria, like they must be a senior from University College with a GPA of 3.5, and that was your scholarship agreement, it would automatically say, hey, you're eligible for the University College Alumni Scholarship. So that's kind of a really cool, unique thing. And it also is no more paper applications. Um, it does outline all of the criteria and the award um, amount that you establish in your fund agreement. So let's say you have a scholarship and you have a group of committee members who are sitting on your scholarship and awards committee. This is a timeline for all scholarships across the university. Students will start applying between November and February for the next fiscal year. So last February to, last November, November 2017 to February 2018, students were applying for scholarships that they will receive this coming fall in the next two weeks. So this coming November through February, they will start applying for scholarships that they will receive in August, September of 2019. Once the February deadline closes, uh, March through May is when you actually, as the scholarship review committee, whoever you choose to sit on that reviewing committee, would actually get access into Tiger Scholarship Manager and you can actually view all of the scholarship recipients who have applied to your scholarship through the system, evaluate them, and actually choose who you want to receive 
your actual scholarship. Then once you review and make your selection in July is when they start to award those students with the scholarship money. And then the process starts all over again in November. Any questions about scholarships? Okay. Um, from the university or from the alumni association? Um, from the university, I do not have that number. From the association, I do know that we have um, 26 different scholarships that have given out approximately $30,000 total um, amongst those 26 scholarships. It does vary because it depends on how many endowed scholarships there are and how many of the current expendable funds. Um, if the groups are not actively replenishing those current expendables, then they can go down to zero and then we lose that opportunity to award those scholarships. If we have a great year on the market, then those endowed scholarships are making more money, which means that 4% is a larger amount to award. Is so 30,000 representing a typical year or a good year or on average? Well, 30,000 is just the minimum that you have to have to establish. Well, uh, no, I was asking you how much oh, across campus, how much, how, much you, uh, how much you have in scholarship money right now? Um, I believe it's been increasing every single year. So it's been a positive. Well, Yes, they, so first what happens is when the student signs on and completes their general application into the system, it automatically shows you, shows the student, here are the ones that you actually match. Now they can click and look at all of the other scholarships because let's say that the other scholarships say they have to have a 3.5 and they have a 3.4. So it won't show them those scholarships, but they could be working on their GPA to raise it to, to award or to apply for those different scholarships. So that they click on it, they fill out the application. Some scholarships re require a letter of recommendation from someone, an essay, or to upload a resume. So those are the things that you can make a requirement in your fund agreement. And then when they're in the TSM for short, Tiger Scholarship Manager, they would just complete all of those requirements. Does that, does that answer? Okay. okay. Yes. So I guess for chapters and, and alumni that are working on the non-endowed scholarship, then that means like between May and September is when they need to designate funds and have, have everything in place so that it can be approved by the university and then be part of that next year cycle. It doesn't have to be during that time frame because again, they are applying for the entire next fall semester. So uh, let's say you had an event in December, you are raising money then, we can still put that money into the scholarship in January, but it wouldn't truly be allocated to be awarded until the following November. But it doesn't matter, you just always wanna be raising money to deposit it into those accounts. And if we have time at the end, we can go back to each section too. So I'll talk a little bit more about finance and those questions you have will be for Monique, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it for her. Um, this is just basic housekeeping of finances for our alumni chapters and groups. Um, basically, all money should be collected um, and placed into the foundation that is an account that's managed by the Alumni Association. So this includes all money from events, fundraising, any donations that you receive. Um, one thing that's very important to know is that you can't just go out and open a bank account um, for your group. Just always go through the university. 
Um, and again, like I said, uh, in the bylaws, you can kind of combine your secretary treasurer. Your alumni coordinator works very closely with Monique and before your meetings typically said, I need a breakdown of all of the finances of the group that I'm overseeing. And she provides that and then your coordinator provides it to you at your meeting. Um, again, all revenue should be mailed to your coordinator. Do not want, you do not want to receive checks or money at your own residence. It's a liability for yourself and for the university just to take, you know, keep your hands clean of it. Just always have money mailed to the Alumni Association. If people ever ask you, who should I, I want to make a donation, who should I make the check out to? Uh, we always like for them to make it out to the University of Memphis Foundation, but if they hand you a check that you're supposed to bring to your coordinator and it's mailed, it's made out to just U of M Alumni Association or Alumni Lambda Chapter or LCM Chapter, we can still deposit them into the foundation. We just prefer that it says University of Memphis Foundation. Again, and all expenses must have a direct relation to your alumni group. So personal finance housekeeping on personal uh, reimbursements. We really don't want you as volunteers for our groups to have to put anything on your personal cards. So if something happens and you are having to make these personal um, expenses on your own, try to be as detailed as possible, keep all original receipts, avoid putting personal and business expenses on one receipt because it becomes a little bit more of a challenge when we're trying to get, reimbur trying to get you reimbursed from your foundation. And always keep in mind that it can take up to four weeks for checks to be issued as a reimbursement. Not ideal, so that's why we try to avoid you guys having to put anything on your personal card. Next. Um, just uh, again, another housekeeping. There's a new process for processing contracts. So if you are working with a group and your coordinator and you actually have to have a contract um, signed for a venue or a caterer that you're using for your event, first rule of business, never sign a contract yourself. Never, ever, ever. If you're, in, you know, you're coordinating the agreement with someone, that's when you bring in your alumni coordinator and we will take it through the Office of Procurement and with the legal office so that it is signed and under all of the rules and regulations of the university. So we used to, the foundation used to be able to sign the contracts for us and make it in a little bit of a more timely fashion. However, that has changed, so we do have to go through the Office of Procurement on campus, which can take a little bit longer, so that's why pre-planning is very important when it comes to events or venues that need contracts. Um, this is kind of like the last thing for the session. Um, you might have seen on your finance spreadsheets that your coordinator has given to you um, a development support fee. This went into effect in 2015, and it is a 5% of a gift um, applied to um, current expendable accounts, those non-endowed accounts. However, if you have a current expendable account that is a scholarship, all scholarships and fellowships are excluded from this 5%. Now, the next slide kind of talks about the purpose. This is the official definition of this 5% support fee, but basically this is to support the development office to provide you guys with accountability of all of the gifts and all the donors to give you the most efficient receipts of your donations, um, keep accurate records, and just kind of support the overall development of the development office and the foundation. So I just want to bring that up because I know um, it was kind of new in 2015, 16, you were slowly seeing it on your financial reports, but now that it's been a couple of years, people are still kind of like, they're getting used to it. So I just wanted to bring it up and if you had any questions about it, we'd be very happy to answer. And that ends the, not the most exciting session, but housekeeping that I should be shared with everyone.